The following content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. It does not constitute means for diagnosis, healthcare advice, nor treatment. Make use of a qualified healthcare professional for such purposes. group and the control group are they both knowing like are they both aware does the control group know they're getting quote unquote a placebo who wants to answer that question oh boy let's see you got a one and a two or a three yes uh no um there you do have like disclosures and stuff like that but usually you don't want them to know because if they know it's more more than likely going to actually affect why researchers lie you can't say <laughs> that is what we don't say lie we call it deception what Right, that is actually the correct term is deception. Uh, yes, sir. So, so would a placebo group say, like, you know, in either a double blind or otherwise situation, would that always be the control group, or why wouldn't that be considered the treatment group still? Because if they believe that they're receiving medication, would that then be like a treatment versus just someone not receiving medication at all? Placebo effects wear off. A treatment, if it was beneficial, and if it actually yielded any results, will carry on. Whereas placebo can only stay so long, right? So for example, uh, one of the reasons that I like to play music before class, first of all, it hypes me up because I think I'm like Lil Wayne or something. I don't know. I think like, I, no, what's the other one? Lil John. I think I'm Lil John. So it hypes me up. And it also allows students to get an impression set. Well, I'm just here in class. No need to be anxious, right? But notice that sometimes that effect can wear off. Right. But in the case of music, we found that it is a good method of treatment. So music wouldn't wear off. But if I gave you guys a new pencil and that's my approach of treatment and that would be my placebo, for example, then in that particular case, it will wear off. It's like, I don't care about this pencil. You know, so I'm just going to throw it away. Whereas music is proven right to work, to enhance attention, mood. So the results, they're seemingly going to be the same at the beginning, but eventually you're going to notice that placebo does wear off. Now, in regards to deception, what's your name, ma'am? I always forget. I'm so sorry. Okay, it's Lisa. Lisa. All right. So Dr. Lisa over here, she mentioned that sometimes the group may not be aware, right? She mentioned that, what's your name? Iman. Iman. Dr. Iman, she mentioned, well, sometimes what happens is the group is not aware. Whenever the group is not aware, we have to make them aware as soon as possible because that is an ethical problem, right? So for example, in the research that you guys are going to participate for this class, if there were deception in the research, you would have to be told that there was deception the second you can be told. And that second is whenever it won't affect the results, right? However, in regards to treatment, in regards to the treatment, and control group, group one and number two, in that two group comparison, notice that in that specific case, ethically and legally, I am obligated to give them some sort of treatment that they could have missed out on. Because they're here participating, thinking, oh man, I'm gonna get this new medication for treating my schizophrenia. When in reality, I'm just giving you a sugar pill. So in regards to that, I would have to let them know you are not being, you are not receiving that treatment. And this is the alternative treatment that you can receive. The same would go for therapy. In the example of the 150 participants, they're thinking, oh man, I'm gonna go to my therapist, help me with my hallucinations, which by the way, really common hallucinations are seen like demons and angels and stuff like that. That's super common. That's probably one of the most common hallucinations. So this person is, I'm struggling seeing demons all the time, trying to get at me or touching me or licking me or blowing air on me and things like that. But then they find out this researcher never used that therapeutic technique on me. So imagine if you went to therapy thinking you were going to receive help and then you find deception. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the control groups um, and letting people know if they're being deceived or not. Does that affect the results? Yes. 
Absolutely. In regards to your question, what's your name, Ash? Ala. Ala. So with Dr. Ala over here, her question is, does it affect the results if we're thinking about deception? Yes, both ways. So for example, if I think I'm being deceived, I can have respondent bias, which is, I think this lady is trying to assess me for schizophrenia. Let me tweak the results a little bit. I'm going to show her how schizophrenic I am. Or I can be like, I think the study is about schizophrenia. I need to back up. I don't need to show this lady how schizophrenic I really am. So even when they don't know they're being deceived, right? And there might have not even been deception in the first place. Really hard for people, especially for mental health, to say, man, I'm struggling. This sucks pretty bad. So whenever you're a research participant, and I'm asking about symptoms, about your manifestation about schizophrenia, even for ourselves, it will be hard to say, yeah, I am struggling with this. So then you're going to have respondent bias. And the same goes if you, when you find out you're being deceived. You can have um, what we call uh, experiment death, which is, bye, I don't want to participate in this research anymore because you lied to me, right? So there's many effects for both issues, whether the person doesn't know they're being deceived. We can also have placebo effects as well. There's so many effects for either. However, when you become a researcher yourself, even if you're in the field of computer science or engineering or social sciences or health sciences, your job as a researcher is going to be to reduce that bias. That is your job, both on your end, on the participants end, and the research end, right? Does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. So continuing this conversation, how do you ethically do the research while still so like reducing that bias? So my thought is, and correct me if I'm wrong, in order to be ethical with the research, you could have, you would have to tell both the treatment group and the control group you may or may not be receiving the medication. Right, you could do exactly that in the consent form. In Alabama, you are a minor until the age of 19. So I don't know if you guys knew that. So if you're not from Alabama, you are a minor until 19, not 18. Alabama. So the person here in our beautiful, good old sweet home, Alabama, they would have to be 19 in order to sign that consent. You may let them know in the consent or you may not. You may not let them know in the consent and let them know as soon as the consent is, as soon as it is possible to let them know. For example, when the results, the information has already been gathered, for example, because as a researcher, or I should say as a participant and also as a patient, you have the right to know the procedures. So if you are part of a research, you're like, man, I wonder what happened with that. You can contact the researcher. And that's also your right as a research participant. Yes, sir. So how do double blind ex uh, experiments I guess, work as far as ethics are concerned if the administrators don't know who is and is not receiving the controller? Right. Who knows about a double blind experiment? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Researchers don't know which group is controlled or the experiment will just make sure that there is no well to try and make sure there's no bias on either side right so i don't know you've received treatment and you don't know if you received treatment so not only you don't know i don't know generally whenever we use deception first of all it is a research technique that is i don't want to say it's rare but it's not as common as you would think right it's actually not common because of that issue because it could be a significant concern. For example, you are not getting treatment that you were told you were going to get, right? So it is pretty rare. I would argue if that's the case, it's more than likely that a person wouldn't have conducted a double blind in that study, because now I can't guarantee you, hey, here's that alternate form of treatment shoot you wanted because you've been deceived, right? So I would argue probably that research wouldn't be approved for double blind. Yes, ma'am. Um, going back to the minor thing, in the state of Alabama, you can sign like medical paperwork at 14. That is correct. And can you sign this paperwork before the age of 19? Nope. You can't be a research participant if you're a minor. However, in the state of Alabama, you can't consent to medical treatment without your parents' consent at the age of 14. <laughs> Which I have a couple that go, as you know, uh, some people come see me for uh, treatment. Um, so, and I work on the supervision, of course, and I do have a couple that they don't want their parents to know absolutely anything if they're like 15, 14, so they come see me. 
If a researcher were to like suspect that the groups they're testing are suspicious of whether they're being tested or not, like would they have to go back and reconduct the experiment and alter it so that they don't try to manipulate the researchers or we actually have statistical procedures to reduce the chances of those individuals affecting the research. So for example, if you're part of that research, right, the 150 schizophrenic participants, and here comes Becky. Anybody here named Becky? <laughs> Good. Okay. So here comes Becky. And she's like, I'm going to show her. I'm going to show her how schizophrenic I am. And she skews the results. I'm going to see that statistically. I'm actually going to see the statistical notation for it and see this person is an outlier. Therefore, this person is skewing the bias. They probably guessed about what the research was about. So she would be eliminated from research. You can actually see that statistically. And that is also part of your job, which is data cleanup procedures later on when you're doing your statistics on research. So it's very unlikely that like the whole group would, would kind of be like collectively suspicious. So like it's very un uncommon for multiple people to do that or? Sometimes the larger the group, of course, the more likely it is that the individual, if there is deception, um, most people think there is deception when there isn't any. When I conducted my own, everybody thought like, oh, where's she trying to ask me? It was really that simple, though. It was really, this is exactly what I'm asking you. There's no woo-woo, you know, mm -hmm. woo magic on it. It's just exactly what I'm asking you. Um, so most people do think there is deception when there isn't any. And you can also see that statistically. So it, is, it isn't as common as you would think. Um, just out of curiosity, when is a double blind experiment done? Like in what scenario? Think about if I have to reduce my own bias, right? So imagine that out of the 150 participants, 20 of them were my students. I want my students to do okay, right? I want my students to get treatment because I believe that this treatment is going to help. So because that's my bias, I want you guys to do okay. And there's 20 people in that research, I will be blinded because that reduces the chances of me putting in my own input in the sampling procedure, right? So whenever we gather participants and then when we impart treatment, I can't be biased myself. Like if I see, you know, some of you like, oh man, here's Dr. So-and-so and that, no, I need them to be in group one. That's when I would do a double blind so that I can reduce the bias and you have an equal opportunity and equal chance at random, whether to receive or not receive treatment. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. right.